I want to welcome everyone to this panel on person-centered medicine. I don't know if you've noticed, but this is the only panel in, at the conference that has uh, only MDs. Most of them have a couple of PhDs and maybe one MD, but this one is clearly special. And I think it's important because I, I was reminded of the reaction of a 10-year-old daughter of a PhD friend of mine when she learned that I was a medical doctor. She said, oh, you're the kind of doctor that helps people. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, and yesterday I attended a panel that was moderated by Dr. Kaljian and during uh, the Q&A session, one of the attendees pointed out that some of the nurses at her hospital referred to their doctors as M deities. So <laughs> I find that kind of humorous, but um, I do think that in this panel we have sort of a pantheon of uh, physicians who set a very high bar, both by virtue of their scientific expertise, but also because uh, they all have um, encouraged in their professional work their colleagues to recover an appreciation of the importance of human dignity in healthcare. So um, I will, uh, each speaker will have 18 to 20 minutes um, to uh, give their comments um, and we, uh, we'll introduce them sequentially and uh, at the end we'll have hopefully about 15 minutes for questions. I've been reminded that we definitely have a hard stop um, at noon because Notre Dame v. Clemson kickoff is at noon, so we'll try to not allow any uh, delay for that reason. So our first speaker is Dr. Brandon Brown. Dr. Brown studied political philosophy as an undergraduate at the University of Dallas and earned graduate degrees from Indiana University in medicine and philosophy. He is the John W. Beeler Professor and Vice Chair of Radiology in the School of Medicine at IU with appointments in the Departments of Pediatrics, Obstetrics and Gynecology, Surgery, Philosophy, and Medical Humanities. His clinical research centers on the use of MRI in pregnancies with complex fetal anomalies. Dr. Brown also serves on the section on bioethics for the American Academy of Pediatrics. He's delivered over 100 invited lectures on topics related to uh, maternal fetal ethics, medical ethics, and medical professionalism. He um, is um, also um, appointed vice chair for fetal imaging research in the Society for Pediatric Radiology, and since 2018, he served as the chair of professionalism for the Radiologic Society of North America. So uh, Dr. Brown will, his talk is entitled Creation and Communion, Persons, Moral Status, and Medicine. Thanks very much for that introduction. It's a real treat to get to be here with all of you and to get to discuss a topic that I think uh, is a beautiful intersection between the scientific and the human, which we encounter every day in the faces and lives of our patients in the hospital and uh, in the lived experience, which I'm gonna talk about some more. So uh, my topic is really the fallout, the consequences of the enlightenment for the human person. And I wanna talk a little bit about what that has meant, where we are. I wanna offer a, maybe a different perspective through the lens of a Russian philosopher and theologian named Berdaev. And then uh, I hope we can talk at the end about um, what that means for medicine and for the care of human beings. So as we talk, I hope we'll all keep these questions in mind, why is it that you are important? And why do you deserve respect? And I bet there are different ways each of us would answer that. 
but I think it's important that we have reflected on these questions, and we're very informed in our thinking by the Enlightenment, especially this man, Immanuel Kant. I suppose we could have a discussion about whether, you know, maybe there's also a prior Cartesian influence, but Kant, I think, is really important. He gave us maybe the most established systematic approach to understanding the moral act, to understanding how we should live. And he created this uh, almost watertight system full of obligations to universal duties. Uh, but he also created it in the context of several consequences of the Enlightenment, specifically an emphasis on our rationality and our autonomy. And these have come down to us in the modern age, in modern secular bioethics, as very necessary to be performed. So our self-awareness becomes a third component and we tend to judge human beings by whether they are persons and we say, well, personhood is a kind of status that is achieved when you can perform rationality, when you can demonstrate autonomy and self-awareness. And uh, if we reflect a lot on that, if we listen to the modern bioethical voices, we get a sense that human beings are standalone, that they're self-sufficient and independent, uh, maybe even a little curved in on ourselves. And uh, Kant was no stranger to this idea. He also saw us as isolated individuals in a way. When he talks about friendship, he says two persons sharing sympathetically in the other's well-being through the moral good and the goodwill that unites them. This is his definition of personhood, and then he follows it up immediately. It's really uh, only an idea. It's unattainable. We're too separate. We're isolated from one another. And so we have that lens projected directly to us today through uh, modern secular bioethics. This is the Bible, you might say, of modern secular bioethics. Now in multiple editions, the principles by Beecham and Childress, uh, and people talk about principalism. It's a heavy focus on autonomy, rationality, and self-awareness. Who has moral status? Well, those who can demonstrate it. Who are persons? Well, the people who do these things. And uh, that's really caused us to move away even from more traditional ideas like dignity. 20 years ago uh, next month in the British Medical Journal, philosopher and bioethicist Ruth Macklin said, we don't really need dignity. What does it add? We've got autonomy, you know? What, uh, what we have is the respect for person ethics that Kant gave us. Why do we need dignity? It's kind of unhelpful. And then I think about my own work, and that doesn't resonate with me because this is the kind of patient I frequently deal with, a newborn, dependent, vulnerable, not expressing much rationality, not very autonomous, right? There's a sense that uh, this patient might not be self-aware. So, should I put them outside my box of persons? Do they fit into the Kantian systematic approach? And that's what personhood has given us. And I have deep concerns about this. I hope you do too. Uh, when we ask ourselves, who deserves respect? In a way, the personhood lens is a mechanism for us to assign humanity, to assign moral status. And that's great if you're on the inside. Uh, but it can be quite exclusive. People, the margins, the peripheries of life, the very young, the very old, the weak, the vulnerable, scripture might say, the least among us, may not fit in this category. And are we comfortable with that? Are we willing to accept that in order to maintain our watertight systematic approach? I wonder if we need to look beyond these confines, the uh, enlightenment respect for persons approach. Um, I think there's been some serious philosophical consequences. There's been a fracturing, not just of humanity into persons and those on the outside, but there's also been a fracturing between the theoretical approach, the systematic categorical imperative of Kant, and the lived experience, the concrete reality of the human patient, the encounter that each of us has to make in our lives and that is certainly made in medicine. So, uh, you know, the Christian tradition is aware of this. In, in Fides et Ratio, St. John Paul II told us human rationalities reached a dead end. And I think he's referring to this idea of autonomous self-sufficiency, this idea that the pinnacle 
of human expression is the perfected reason. And that can really distract us from some important characteristics of ourselves. Uh, we can end up subsuming the human person. The personalism of St. John Paul II says the human being always has to be an end of themselves. They can never be a means toward another end. But if we create a systematic approach, if we accept the enlightenment inheritance, human beings can end up becoming the means to satisfying our watertight system, to keeping our categorical imperative. And we've shifted uh, away from the human being. There's a second fracturing, and that's between the body and the mind. Descartes famously gave us this division, and we haven't accepted it as co-equals. We've prioritized the mind over the body. And I, I would argue we've gone a step further in the modern era, and we have denied the body. We have increasingly sought to overthrow the body and to reject the goodness of the body. This is really the Gnostic approach, right? The material created world, the body is to be left behind. What matters, the thing is to know the gnosis, the secret knowledge. And the body is dragging us down. Um, that's a problem if we wanna keep our focus on human persons. And I think former Pope Benedict XVI of Happy Memory was talking about this at the very beginning of his first encyclical, right? God is love. He says, being Christian is not the result of an ethical choice or a lofty idea. He's, he's referring to Kant, I think, here. It's an encounter with an event, a person. He's saying we don't need to choose between fulfilling the ethical law and attention to persons because we've been given the incarnation which has fulfilled the law in a person. This is really important to his approach, to the approach of personalism, which I should emphasize is not meant to be a replacement for the category of personhood. It's meant to throw off subcategories and to focus on what it means to be human, not in exclusive subdivisions, not in these bizarre categories of person, human being, and non-person, human being, but to reveal what is true about each of us in our humanity. So I want to take just a moment to reflect on a thinker who I wonder is a little neglected in our minds. We talk a lot about the personalism of St. John Paul II. We spend less time talking about Berdayev, a Russian philosopher and theologian who spent a lot of time on this same topic, his phrase that he liked to use was the human personality. And he was very concerned with the exclusive nature of the Enlightenment inheritance. He's, he's not part of modern secular bioethics. He was late 19th century. But he's really concerned about our tendency to want to assign humanity. And he believes that revealing the human personality is bringing forth, drawing forth something that's already there. He's coming from a phenomenological tradition. He's interested in the concrete acting person. And he says that knowing is more than passive observation. It's more than cataloging. It's an encounter. He wants not an abstract moral system, but an ethic of encounter. And he says the personality, the human personality, is the image and likeness of God and man. He's fascinated by the idea of creation, the image of God in which scripture tells us we all came to be through our creation. And he thinks that means we need to focus on the wisdom of the body. The goodness of creation indicates the goodness of the body. So he's operating from an entirely different perspective. This is an anti-Gnostic perspective, not a denial, not a denigration, but a focus on the goodness of the body. And creation, in Berdayev's model, is our means of communion with God because it's not a once-and-done act. It's an ongoing, eternal act of creation, and we ourselves he would say, are creations participating in creation. We are most encountering God when we are continuing the eternal act of creation. So his personalism, his acting personality, uh, is not about assigning status. It's about revealing what's true about us. And uh, that's something that I see a lot. This is a startling image. You might say a graphic image. It's a partially delivered child. This is an exit procedure I was part of a number of years ago in which we perform a hysterotomy, a partial cesarean delivery. We get halfway delivered 
and then we focus on a problem, in this case a tumor in the hypopharynx of the child. We drain some of the fluid in the tumor, we put a tube down to maintain the airway, then once we're confident that we have sustained this life, we complete the delivery and cut the cord, which up to that point has been our lifeline. And it uh, is a really evocative image for me of this idea of creations participating in creation through our encounter with human beings. This is a quote from Pope Benedict's last encyclical, the one that he didn't quite complete. Persons always live in relationship. We come from others, we belong to others, our lives are enlarged by our encounter with others. They are linked to others who have gone before us. Or in the words of St. Paul, what I have received, I've handed on to you. We're links in part of a much larger story than any one of us alone. So Berdayev is focused on the person and as the locus of moral life, not in abstractions, not in systematic categorical imperatives or generalities, and he thinks our ethic has to revolve around this idea of the human personality. He thinks that individualism is the enemy of this. It's the reverse, the autonomous, performative individualism of modern secular bioethics. And nothing for me evokes that more than this painting right here. This is by Bruegel. It's called Landscape and the Fall of Icarus. And you can see a farmer plowing a field, uh, and you can see a ship, and maybe you'll notice some feet kicking out of the water. You know the ancient Greek story of Icarus and Daedalus, right? Daedalus, the inventor, builds wax wings. His son Icarus flies. Uh, too much hubris, too close to the sun that melts the wings and he dies. And uh, we have some reflections on this in the, in the tradition, the Western tradition. Uh, the poet Auden says in Bruegel's Icarus, for instance, how everything turns away quite leisurely from the disaster. The plowman may have heard the splash, the forsaken cry, but for him, it was not an important failure. And the expensive, delicate ship that must have seen something amazing a boy falling out of the sky, had somewhere to get to and sailed calmly on. This is autonomous, isolated individualism. This is each of us solipsistically focusing on our own existence. And so the fracturing is a consequence that we have to deal with today in medicine. This inheritance that Berdayev wants to reveal as deeply problematic and flawed is something that we encounter every day in the hospital, the priority of minds over bodies, the denigration of the body. And why are we afraid of the body, you know? Why is it that we want to set it aside? Well, it's a, it's a limit. It reminds us of our weakness, of our vulnerability. The margins of life are distasteful. People don't want to think about the beginning of life and the end of life. We'd like to focus on the middle because we can cocoon ourselves in technology and completely forget our dependence we can play a game of self-sufficiency. So uh, the modern counter that we see every day in the hospital in secular bioethics says we don't need nature. In fact, the project of the Enlightenment, Francis Bacon told us, was the conquering of nature in the relief of man's estate. Human will can destroy nature, and really we've done a pretty good job. We have thrown off every restraint. We've thrown off every control. The last frontier, the body it still weighs us down. It can't be completely escaped. We want to think of it as a burden, as an article of clothing, as something holding us back from revealing our true selves. And yet, the tradition of personalism, of Berdayev, of the Christian tradition says, no, you are your body. It is not a constraint, it is you yourself. It's a radically different way of thinking about it, and it's a radically different way of approaching patients. So uh, we need to push back. We need the creation-focused emphasis of Berdayev that focuses on the wisdom of the body. If we're made in the image and likeness of God, then the goodness of the body is clear because it's drawn directly from the goodness of God. Atheistic secular materialism would say, no, you're not made in the image and likeness of God. You're made in the image of society. So... What does that say about the body? Do we know? Can we know the goodness of the body? Well, no. I need to know what society you're coming from. I need to know your status. I need to know your rank. I need to know what war you're fighting, right? Is it rich versus poor? Or is it 
master versus servant, teacher versus student, man versus woman, parent versus child, and then we can talk about your image. That's um, a problem when it comes to the most vulnerable and weak among us. And that's the thing that can't be abstracted. We have to focus on the concrete reality, the ethic of encounter. This is a patient that I see in the children's hospital. They have a gastrostomy tube. And uh, they are very weak and vulnerable. They can't even talk to me. They can't even thank me. And it's easy to focus on them as limited. But I myself am limited. When am I rational? All the time? Well, I don't know. Am I rational and autonomous and self-aware when I'm asleep? What if I get hit in the head and I'm unconscious? What about when I was very young or someday each of us will encounter dementia? Will we still be that person of the enlightenment? Will we still be worthy of respect? The developing human body, these are images of an MRI of a fetus that's developing. We are aware that it happens in the young, but each of us sitting here is in a process of an evolving body. We're slowly developing and degenerating, every one of you right now. It's a sobering thought, but it's true. Our life isn't a fixed point. We're constantly moving through various stages. Which one are we comfortable pinning the status, the moral status of personhood on? At which stage are you your truest self? And if you don't want to answer that way, maybe you should question the idea of personhood. Even the functions of our life, our peak physical condition, or our sexual abilities, our emotional, intellectual abilities, these don't occur at a plateau, at a fixed point. They're constantly evolving. They're not a crystallized state. They're a wave. These are MRI images of the brain showing developing brain volume loss because of lack of blood flow. Every one of us in this room is starting to develop spots like this right now. It's terrifying and true. To what degree does that affect your personhood? So I just want to wrap up by reminding us that the idea of reason and autonomy being the, the pinnacle of human existence, the perfection of the human person, misconstrues who we are, and it attempts to assign humanity rather than revealing humanity. It neglects the encounter of relationship, our capacity to love and be loved. And that's for every person, even the ones who can't reach out, even the ones who can't speak, even if it's merely, in the words of St. Augustine, a heart speaking directly to a heart. Each of us, in our own way, in our own limited capacity, is able to reach out to some degree. St. Gregory of Nyssa, called the doctor of human dignity, tells us, don't despise those who sit idle. Consider who they are, and you'll discover their dignity. They represent the person of the Savior. This is a detail from Van Gogh's The Good Samaritan. A lot of people walked by that human being and weren't able to see a person, weren't able to see the truth the reality of that existence. And it took someone who was able, from the outside, excluded, to look deeply, to see truly what was happening. Can we do that? Are we capable of that? I hope you'll come away from this session thinking about ourselves not just as capable of cognitive performance, but as created for loving and receiving love. Thanks very much. Thanks, Dr. Brown, for very nicely sort of setting the table for this panel by introducing us to the philosophical roots of the notion of person and to the figure of Berdayev as a, one of the fathers of personalism and then connecting very nicely how philosophical notions can inform professional practice. Our um, second speaker is Loris Kaljian. Dr. Kaljian is an internist and director of the program in bioethics and humanities at the University of Iowa Carver College of Medicine, where he's also full professor in the Department of Internal Medicine and the Richard M. Kaplan Chair in Biomedical Ethics and Medical Humanities. He received his medical degree from the University of Michigan and a Master of Divinity and a PhD in Christian ethics from Yale. He had his clinical training at Yale in internal medicine and infectious diseases and has worked at the University of Iowa since the year 2000. 
At Iowa, he developed a biomedical ethics thread for medical students over the course of their four years of studies, and he co-directs the Humanities Distinction Tract track to prepare students to integrate the medical humanities into their medical careers and prepare them to be effective promoters of humanism in medicine. Many of his reflections are brought together in his book entitled Practicing Medicine and Ethics, Integrating Wisdom, Conscience, and Goals of Care, published through Cambridge University Press. Beyond the university, Dr. Kaljian has served on the ethics committees of the United Network for Organ Sharing, the Society of General Internal Medicine, the American College of Physicians, and the Iowa Medical Society. He's also served as deputy editor for the Journal of General Internal Medicine and currently serves on the editorial board of the journal Communication and Medicine. Dr. Kaljian's contributions to the medical profession have been recognized by a Merit Award from the Iowa Medical Society and a Laureate Award from the Iowa chapter of the American College of Physicians. His talk this morning is entitled Promoting Human Value and Moral Agency in Healthcare by Recognizing Patients and Clinicians as Persons. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Joe, for the kind introduction. And uh, thank you, Dr. Brown, for setting the stage so well. And I think you'll see and hear some profoundly deep resonances and harmonies between, yes, thank you. Yeah, you can put that on. Uh, thank you. Um, between what, what you have said and what well, I, will, I will have to say. And before um, I begin, I'd like to acknowledge David and Lou Solomon, who are sitting uh, toward the back there. And many, if not most or all of you, will know David's name as the founder of this conference. And I just have to acknowledge with profoundly deep personal gratitude once again to David uh, for over 10 years ago, as I put it, taking me in when I was a stranger knocking on his door at Notre Dame to get to know him and the work of the center. And if it were not for David's kindness and and a uh, mentoring, uh, I wouldn't be here today. So thank you, David, and thank you. Okay. <clears throat> Last little bit of introduction. When I teach uh, medical students, I use all too many slides. Today, only one. <laughs> and there it is, because I thought, well, why don't I at least put the references up in case that's helpful for anyone so you don't have to wonder about them. Otherwise, I'll do it uh, the... Uh, the traditional way. Okay, and also I would say, you'll notice there's an updated uh, title to my presentation in case uh, that's of interest. So, in the second volume of his three-volume work on ethics as theology, the Anglican theologian Oliver O'Donovan observes that the concept of person points in two directions. On the one hand, it points to the individual substance or essence that is presupposed in the very condition of human existence. On the other, it points to the expression of that substance in the, severe, in the sphere of responsibility and action. In the interest of time, and if you'll allow me to depart from my original title, I am going to focus only on the first of these, the meaning of persons as it applies to our understanding of patients, especially those patients who are least capable of displaying those behavioral attributes we understand to be characteristically human. I would like to think about the patient as person and how a Christian understanding of persons sheds much needed light on the boundaries and justification of individual human moral status. I draw generously from the work of O'Donovan and also from the Catholic German philosopher Robert Spayman to think about how a Christian understanding of persons calls us to welcome as persons those patients who may be considered the very least among us, the smallest, the oldest, the most hidden, the least able or rational or aware, even those whose mortal frames give no signs to us that awareness exists or might return. I have in mind here the extreme conditions of neurological compromise of the comatose and the so-called brain dead. 
Does the concept of person apply to them? Well, that depends on your concept of person. As many attendees at this conference are aware, the concept of person that has been handed down in our Western culture is thoroughly Christian. The Christian concept was developed through theological reflections on both the Trinity and the Incarnation, as the early church engaged the testimony of Scripture to understand and articulate how one God could be three persons and how Jesus Christ could be one person with two natures. These theological developments had implications for mankind as well, as the relationship between human substance and human nature, especially our rational nature, was clarified. But the Christian concept of person that was bequeathed to the West has suffered secular erosion. It has shifted the focus from persons who have a nature to persons who are defined by characteristics typical of that nature. In our current culture, the question who is a person or what is a person now lays down a challenge which asks us to decide whether we view all human beings as kindred worthy of our love or whether we prefer instead to predicate person on nature by using one or another set of prerequisites that make our respect for human beings dependent on demonstrable properties that must first be acquired and then preserved in order for the conditions of so-called personhood to be satisfied. This challenge is very real in healthcare, especially at the beginning of life, the end of life, and when severe injury or disability results in profound neurological compromise. I wonder what you think about patients who are persistently comatose or diagnosed with so-called brain death. Do you think they are persons? Why or why not? This question puts a very fine and practical point on a question that might otherwise remain all too theoretical. By thinking about such patients, we come face to face with the reality of comatose persons who give no behavioral indication of responsivity to our care and patients so severely compromised that they are made eligible for having their lives ended by having their organs removed. These are the kinds of examples that help us probe the edges of the so-called boundary problem in ethics, which aims to answer the basic question, who counts as a person? <clears throat> in a few moments, I will draw from O'Donovan and Spayman to sketch the outlines of a concept of the person that stands in stark contrast to assessments that define persons on the basis of human qualities, attributes, or performance characteristics. That sketch presents a view of the human person that includes every human being because they and we are brothers and sisters made in the image of God, made to reflect his glory and his love. But before doing so, I'd like to first offer a couple of illustrations of what happens when a Christian concept of person is abandoned or weakened. Among those who would promote notions of personhood premised on a specific set of human qualities, we can understand why emphasis is placed on capacities like self-consciousness, rationality, intentionality, and relationality. In 1972, Joseph Fletcher, the proponent of what was known as situation ethics, wrote a short but bold article with an ambitious title in one of the first bioethics journals. He entitled it, Indicators of Humanhood, a Tentative Profile of Man. In it, he proposed 15 qualities that characterize personhood, and you can imagine what they are. Minimal intelligence, self-awareness, self-control, sense of time, sense of futurity, sense of the past, capability to relate to others, concern for others, communication, control of existence, curiosity, change and changeability, balance of rationality and feeling, idiosyncrasy, neocortical function. Those were his 15. We can be grateful our society did not rely on Fletcher for advice about how to set the bar for our legal and social understanding of persons. And if you know about Fletcher's positions on moral issues and his departure from the Episcopalian priesthood in favor of secular humanism, you might not be very surprised about the 15 qualities he proposed. But you may still be shocked to learn where the logic of his convictions led him. Here is what he wrote in the Atlantic Monthly in 1968 about children with Down syndrome. 
People have no reason to feel guilty about putting a Down syndrome baby away, whether it's put away in the sense of hidden in a sanitarium or in a more responsible, lethal sense. It is sad, yes, dreadful, but it carries no guilt. True guilt arises only from an offense against a person. A Downs is not a person. I trust you're as disturbed as I am by 1968 Atlantic Monthly, University of Virginia professor. There we are. But let's take another example, one that is quite different and from a very different thinker and yet not entirely unrelated. I have in mind the famous Protestant ethicist Paul Ramsey. Now, please note, I have no intention of casting aspersions on Paul Ramsey by mentioning his name in the company of Joseph Fletcher. Right. Ramsey wrote deeply about medicine, ethics, Christian faith, and persons, and I have benefited much from his work. But I do want to question his justification of an exception to what is otherwise a remarkably life-respecting prohibition against euthanasia in his work. It comes as a surprise to me that, despite that vigorous opposition to euthanasia, Ramsey was willing to entertain the possibility that some human beings are beyond the reach of our care and therefore can be subjected to euthanasia on the grounds that they are indifferent to our care. In his 1974 book entitled The Patient as Person, he articulates his position as follows. Never abandon care of the dying except when they are irretrievably inaccessible to human care. Never hasten the dying process except when it is entirely indifferent to the patient, whether his dying is accomplished by an intravenous bubble of air or by the withdrawal of useless ordinary natural remedies such as nourishment. The condition of the patient renders it for him a matter of complete indifference, whether humankind's final act toward him directly or indirectly allows death to come. He already is beyond our love and care. It seems to me that Ramsey is effectively implying that these patients are no longer persons. How else, on his view, could they legitimately be subjected to killing? And apart from the question of euthanasia, what do we think of his suggestion that some human beings are beyond our love and care? By way of an answer, let me now move to O'Donovan and Spayman. O'Donovan recounts the development in the Christian concept of person that began in the patristic period during debates about the Trinity and the person of Christ. He recounts this development in great, beautiful detail. These debates drew the sharp distinction between the concepts of person and nature. Person, or substance, was used to represent the principle of individual existence, and nature to represent the complex of attributes which constitute the distinct distinctness of divinity and humanity. And then through the influence of Boethius, the concept that arose from the unique person of Christ became generalized to all persons. In short, the human individual came to be seen not as the sum of his or her human attributes, but as someone who has those attributes. But over time, things changed. There was an erosion of Boethius's understanding of person as substance and the Christological basis of his view, which was forgotten. This made it possible to read Boethius as though a person were merely the particular instance of a rational nature. O'Donovan concludes by saying, the history of the concept of person is the history of how nature takes over from substance as the primary category. Spayman, who lived from 1927 to 2018, in 1996 wrote a remarkable book entitled Persons, The Difference Between Someone and Something, which explores the essence and implications of a Christian view of persons. Incidentally, it's interesting to note that the English translation is done by Oliver O'Donovan. He clearly uh, enjoyed teaching from that work and thought it was time to translate the whole thing. I'd like to highlight four of Spayman's points regarding persons. First, it is wrong to predicate personhood on rational nature because doing so separates the life of human beings from the concept of, hu of, of person. We are more than mere exemplars of a kind because we are kindred who stand from the outset 
in a personal relation to one another. Belonging to the human family cannot depend on empirically demonstrated properties. Either the human family is a community of persons from the word go, or else the very concept of a person as someone in his or her own right is unknown or forgotten. Second, when we consider the realities of human development and child rearing, we see that we recognize someone as a person before we can see the attributes that characterize their personal nature. There is no graduated transition from a something to a someone. It is only because we treat human beings from the start as someone, not as something, that the majority of human beings actually develop the properties that then justify the way we have treated them. Third, the severely disabled, though profoundly dependent, nevertheless belong to the human race and they participate in the community of persons simply as recipients of physical and moral support, though they themselves may be incapable of recognition in all that follows from it. But lest we are tempted to lord ourselves over the severely disabled, Spayman would open our eyes to see that they actually give more than they receive. For the person who cares for the severely disabled is unable to see the deepest meaning of a community of persons. Why? Because the recognition given to the profoundly disabled is not directed merely to personal properties, but toward the person, him or herself. It is in that person's lack of such properties that they constitute the paradigm for a human community that recognizes selves rather than the properties we find useful or attractive. In this way, the severely disabled allow us to see the true ground of human self-respect. Fourth, there can be only one criterion for persons, and only one, biological membership of the human race. What it is to be a person is to live a human life. That is why, Spayman says, there is no sense in saying such things as brain death means the death of the person even if the human being is still alive. Here then is the straightforward answer to the question of which human beings are persons, and it's a categorical answer based on biological membership through birth, which Lydia Yeager refers to as filiation. As human beings, we are begotten, not made, and at birth we are rightly welcomed, not scrutinized for the possession of prerequisite qualities, as if we were merely potential members of a community whose respect we have to earn, rather than actual members of a family into which we have been born. This brings us to a final point about the epistemological relationship between persons and love. And for this I turn again to O'Donovan because he articulates so well the connection between the modern question, who is a person, and the ancient question from the Gospel of Luke, who is my neighbor? When it comes to the mistaken quest of pretending to understand the qualities of personhood, O'Donovan acknowledges that there are many ways in which this complex of attributes, capabilities, and performances may be proven experimentally, from the simplest behavioral test to the most sophisticated biological test but this will not tell us whether any being is a person. For the only way we can discern a person is by love, which allows us to discern a significance which we have reason to believe God attributes to all members of Adam's race. This conviction allows us to commit ourselves in personal relationship to those whose personality we could not discern, to children in the womb, for example, or to the severely handicapped. When we come to discern that these two are persons, irreplaceable and irreducibly important, we do so only after, not before, we have committed ourselves to them in personal interaction. O'Donovan nicely concludes by noting that, to, to discern my neighbor, I have first to prove neighbor to him. To perceive a brother or sister, I have first to act in a brotherly way. To know a person, I have first to accept him as such in personal interaction. Let me close my remarks by returning very briefly to the question of so-called brain death in light of these reflections about persons. 
If we agree with O'Donovan and Spayman that the categories of person and human being are identical, and if we also agree that we should never intend the killing of innocent persons, it seems to me that we need to question the use of brain death criteria for organ transplantation because those criteria disqualify living human beings from protections that would otherwise guard against actions that inflict death by removing vital organs. I also think we should wonder whether the endeavor to redefine death by neurological criteria has been employed since the 1960s to circumvent the question of whether patients diagnosed with brain death are still persons. And even if this was not the intent of the promotion of brain death as a construct, it seems to me an argument can be made that a neglect of the meaning of persons has been one of its consequences. Thank you very much. Thanks, Dr. Kaljian, for kind of drilling down on the Christian notion of person and showing, contrasting how the secular notion and the Christian notion are really sort of the fault line for a lot of the uh, bioethics conflicts today. Our final speaker is Dr. Michael Redinger. Dr. Redinger is a psychiatrist on the faculty of Western Michigan University Homer Stryker, MD, School of Medicine in Kalamazoo, where he has joint appointments in the departments of psychiatry and is co-chair of the Department of Medical Ethics, Humanities, and Law. He's a native of Idaho and a proud alumnus of the University of Notre Dame. He completed a dual MD and MA in bioethics and health policy with a concentration in Catholic healthcare ethics at Loyola University, Chicago, Stritch School of Medicine, and the Newswanger Institute for Bioethics. He currently serves as the young, in the young physician section representative on the Michigan State Medical Society Board of Directors and as an alternate delegate from Michigan to the American Medical Association. He's published widely in the New England Journal of Medicine, in CHEST, in the Cambridge Quarterly of Healthcare Ethics and uh, other major journals. He's also published in popular media, including the New York Times, Detroit Free Press, America, and Commonweal. Uh, his talk is entitled, Reorienting Corporate Catholic Healthcare Toward the Person. Dr. Redinger. Um, I was thinking of Joe's comments earlier about the, the kind of doctors that help people. And in my family, I'm a psychiatrist, but my wife is an emergency medicine doc. And so my kids, think of me a little bit as the doctor that helps people, but my wife is the doctor who really helps people. <laughs> and for those of you who know my wife, that wouldn't surprise you at all. Um, so last month, Ascension Health, a nonprofit Catholic health system operating 139 hospitals in 19 states with over 139 employees and affiliated personnel, announced that their 10 hospitals and associated outpatient clinics in Southeast and Central Michigan would form a joint venture with Henry Ford Health, a secular nonprofit health system based in Detroit. The resultant entity would be branded under Henry Ford, led by the existing Henry Ford CEO and based out of existing Henry Ford headquarters. A press release explaining the decision stated, Though a fully integrated, through a fully integrated healthcare delivery network, the joint venture will deliver exceptional performance in quality, safety, and service. This expanded care network will create greater opportunities to coordinate, grow, and adapt ser services and care settings to meet customer needs in the new post-pandemic normal, expanding access to care, lowering costs, and improving health outcomes. Pending federal and state regulatory approval, this transaction is expected to close in the summer of 2024, but notably, regulatory approval is not a guarantee as the Federal Trade Commission and state regulators closely scrutinize healthcare system consolidations of this size due to concerns about quasi-monopoly formation and the subsequent risk of increased downstream costs to insurers and patients. 
So unlike typical mergers of Catholic and non-Catholic healthcare entities, which often result in the Catholic entity insisting upon and having the leverage to force non-Catholic hospitals to adopt the USCCB's ethical and religious directives for Catholic healthcare, the press release for the Ascension Ford joint venture stated, quote, both organizations are committed to working to maintain the Catholic identity of the Ascension Michigan facilities included in the partnership. Conversations on the future state of the Catholic identity of these facilities is ongoing. Now, what I, what I would like to suggest in this talk is that in an important way, the outcome of those conversations won't matter. That is, unless one considers the Catholic identity of a health system to consist only in its refusal to perform certain reproductive health procedures, the economic pressures which have driven healthcare consolidation across the United States in all sectors have already stripped the Catholic essence from corporate Catholic healthcare, regardless of their state affiliation with the church, the existence of Vatican-approved public juridic persons providing sponsorship, or their employment of administrators charged with ensuring quote, mission integration, unquote. The purpose of this talk is to explain how we got here in Catholic healthcare and how it must and can be changed for the better if it is to extend the healing mission of Christ and aid in the church's evangelization of society. So to defend my thesis, a bit of background is necessary to understand why Catholic healthcare exists in the way that it does and to explain further the ecclesial and economic challenges which have driven the formation of multi-state Catholic healthcare corporations over the past two decades. I suspect most here are familiar with the origin story of American Catholic healthcare. Starting in the 19th century and through the 20th, in order to meet widespread healthcare needs and inspired and modeled by Christ the Divine Healer, communities of religious sisters formed and operated Catholic hospitals open to all, but with a specific orientation towards serving the impoverished. The sisters ran the hospital and provided direct service, nursing the patients who came through their doors. Through their presence and selflessness, the Catholic hospitals weren't just an extension of the sisters' charism, they were infused with an unmistakable Catholicity. Over the decades of the 20th century, medical advancements corresponded with increased funding for healthcare services, first through the explosion of private health insurance as an employment benefit during World War II, and later with the formation of government-funded health insurance insurance in the form of Medicare and Medicaid. Healthcare became a big business and now makes up approximately one-sixth of the U.S. economy. Catholic healthcare, run by the sisters, continue, continued to enjoy the sisters' bedside presence, but operations began to scale up and it certainly employed non-Catholics both in patient care roles and in operational and, or executive roles. In the latter half of the 20th century, as communities of religious sisters began to decrease in numbers and age into retirement, Catholic hospitals transitioned to lay boards under religious community sponsorship and planned, planning for the eventual exit of the sisters from Catholic healthcare entirely continued in earnest. Whereas in 1968, over 96% of Catholic hospital CEOs were members of religious communities, now almost none are. In the last two decades, as many of the founding religious communities have gone entirely extinct, Catholic health systems have themselves created their own sponsoring entities called public juridic persons approved by the Vatican that are intended to replicate the role of religious communities in shepherding the Catholic identity of the organization. The members of the PJP may be identical to the members of the, of the system's board of directors or exist separately and confirm members of the board. Meanwhile, the, American health, um, the expansion of American healthcare broadly was recognized as unsustainable for both private insurers and the government and various initiatives in the late 20th century were instituted to rein in exploding costs. Managed care and cutbacks in Medicare and Medicaid reimbursement have forced health systems to identify ways to maintain or expand services on increasingly thin margins. In order to gain purchasing leverage, minimize duplication of services, and increase organizational efficiencies, over the last three decades, healthcare has undergone a massive reorganization and consolidation into larger and larger systems. These systems span entire regions of the country, include hundreds of hospitals, thousands of employees, and millions of patients. Catholic healthcare was no exception to this trend, and I suspect the names of the large multi-state corporate Catholic systems, such as Ascension, Trinity, Common Spirit, are recognizable to most of you. Likely many of us in this room are their patients. So in response to the exit of, our, of the sisters from Catholic healthcare, Catholic theologians, clergy ethicists, physicians, and more have thought critically about the resulting challenges to Catholic identity. 
Now, it would be impossible in the scope of this talk to fairly review 30 years of scholarly work in this er area, really beginning in the 1990s. So allow me to focus on a few significant points and areas of disagreement. Cardinal Joseph Bernadin, while receiving cancer treatment in the mid-1990s at Loyola University of Chicago, which is coincidentally the institution I had later, later received my medical degree in bioethics training, wrote extensively about challenges to Catholic healthcare. He stated that these concerns have, quote, in the past found expression primarily in concern over being faithful to the religious and ethical directives with particular attention to life and reproductive issues. More recently, it has been seen that this is too narrow an understanding of Catholic identity. After then noting the new, that the then new formation of Catholic systems, co-sponsored by several religious institutes, he said, quote, it seems to me that we have not developed ecclesiological categories adequate to the new realities of expanded identity, healthcare as a ministry of the entire church, and new structures to support the ministry, unquote. But he was optimistic that as long as Catholic healthcare continued to comfort and provide hope, not necessarily in a cure, but in living in God's loving care, that its Catholicity could be sustained. Now, Notre Dame theologian Richard McCormick, in a 1998 piece provocatively titled The End of Catholic Hospitals, stated the conundrum as follows. He said, some entities within Catholic healthcare may gain the whole world. That is, they may gain the world of their immediate service area in this streamlined medical model. But will they suffer the loss of their own soul? Ultimately, he argued that healthcare had become, a, quote, a brutal competitive environment where any sense of mission can be smothered by bottom line thinking, unquote, and that the hospital's ability to care for the indigent and marginalized would diminish, pastoral care would be threatened, and that, quote, hospitals will eventually suffer from the conflicted loyalties of profit-minded physicians. Now, as a side, he got this part wrong. It's actually been the physicians who have been subsumed into and beholden to the systems. But against Bernadine, he was skeptical that Catholic-labeled systems employing mostly non-Catholic physicians and nurses and run by non-Catholics could be expected to project a Catholic vision of hope. Over the subsequent three decades, while it's accepted as a given that threats to the, of the, to the Catholic identity of Catholic healthcare systems exist, response to criticisms or concerns about Catholic identity have taken two structural forms. First, Catholic health systems have increasingly employed a cadre of administrators with backgrounds generally in Catholic philosophy or theology to work in mission integration. These administrators have as their main function acting as the institution's liaison with local bishops, orienting employees to the ERDs, and developing formation programs for system administrators, the board of directors, and more concerning, the groups of individuals who actually make up their sponsoring ent entities, the, the PJPs. They also extensively, extensively write in the academic literature and Catholic Health Association fora about their various efforts and occasionally provide post hoc rationalizations of questionable decisions made by system CEOs or their efforts to effectuate institutional policies to prevent questionable decisions by CEOs from being made in the future. Second, the USCCB continues to revise the ERDs with particular attention paid to the sixth section on collaborative arrangements with other healthcare organizations and providers. Changes in this section focus on emphasizing the oversight role of the local bishop and insisting upon careful consideration of potential and existing collaborations which might undermine the church's witness or cause scandal, which have certainly happened in the last 30 years. The question is, have these efforts been successful? Ultimately, I believe the answer is no. Unfortunately, the economic situation in a modern American healthcare require administrating these systems no differently than for-profit entities. McCormick's prediction, in this case, has been vindicated. If the famous aphorism of no margin, no mission uh, was used to justify decisions of Catholic hospitals over the years, I think it can now be restated as if mission, no margin. Or, sorry, if margin, no mission. Consider the following scandals which have embroiled just one Catholic system over the last five years. And please note, while many secular criticisms of Catholic healthcare relate to its refusal to provide services contrary to church teaching, I, I support those refusals. I believe that those refusals are necessary but not sufficient to ensure a Catholic entity's Catholic identity. Rather, my criticisms illustrate examples that show how profit-seeking behaviors undermine, um, undermine Catholic social teaching and the common good. So these scandals include a system that has utilized its revenue to build a multi-billion dollar private equity operation, which bankrolled a medical debt collection agency and triggered a Senate investigation, 
one that sold the medical data of 50 million patients to Google without their knowledge or consent, others who have refused to recognize the bargaining units of their employees, one that, ignited, one, uh, one that certainly ignited its own staffing crisis during the COVID-19 pandemic by systematically reducing its number of employees per occupied bed and cutting labor costs by $500 million in the years immediately preceding the pandemic. Another example would include a system which has slashed services in poor neighborhoods to siphon services to wealthier ones while keeping those hospitals on the books, it primarily to gain access to a federal law which allows them to purchase drugs from manufacturers at roughly a 50% discount. All these examples are well documented, publicly searchable. And they do not include the many small decisions which frustrate nurses and physicians on a daily basis. Now, one could hear of these problematic practices and respond by either A, following the lead of the health systems and portray these criticisms as unfair hit jobs motivated by anti-Catholic animus, or B, claim that they're isolated examples of poor or inadequately formed management. But I think the answer is C, that Catholic healthcare systems are insufficiently infused by well-formed Catholics motivated by the healing mission of, Christ, healing mission of the church and empowered to drive corporate decision making subject to economic pressures that unavoidably drive CEO behaviors more than mission considerations and divorce from the charism of their founders. So it strains, as in my opinion, the credibility to believe that these institutions really are still genuinely or credibly Catholic. If, the, if uh, certain banks became, quote, too big to fail during the 2008 financial crisis, I think Catholic hospitals would become too big to be Catholic. So in order for Catholic healthcare to regain its Catholicity, its charism, it must be reoriented toward the person. In order to model Christ the healer, the structure of Catholic healthcare must be reconsidered. The threats of corporate consolidation must be better recognized and appreciated. First, the skill set which enables one to run a modern Catholic healthcare system appears to have no overlap with the ability to discern as a well-formed Catholic. Nor does there appear to be any empirical evidence that formation programs to develop these skills and system leaders are successful in doing so. Second, the concept and execution of a public juridic person as an organization sponsoring entity is deeply flawed. Pragmatically, they either consist of the regular board, which, which, with members selected based on priorities other than ensuring Catholic identity, or they are not truly empowered to direct the board in its strategic planning or executives in day-to-day -day operations to avoid inevitable scandal. Similarly, the diocesan bishop, as envisioned by the ERDs, cannot reasonably be expected to understand or exercise authority over a multi-state entity with annual revenues in the billions. Perhaps an entity under the auspices of the USCCB could convene individuals with sufficient expertise and authority to provide oversight of corporations of this size, but they would need to have the resources at their disposal to investigate allegations that systematically, sorry, to investigate allegations that systems have failed in their Catholic identity and empowered to force changes. Finally, it may be that Catholic systems must be broken up. Unfortunately, the economic pressures, pressures that have driven consolidation in the first place may make this option unfeasible. In that case, divestment may be a more viable and palatable option. I want to conclude by noting that a retreat from Catholic healthcare as is currently structured does not mean retreat from Catholic healthcare. Opportunities exist to cultivate a holistic holistic Catholic approach grounded in the integral development of the human person. And there are many who are left behind by American healthcare, for-profit and non-for-profit alike. Perhaps a way to refocus our efforts would be to utilize the language of preferential option for those populations who include the mentally ill, the drug addicted, the in utero, and the physically disabled. Whatever the model, it must respect the collective bargaining rights of hospital employees and demonstrate a commitment to subsidiarity and solidarity with its local community partners. But I'm out of time, so. We'll, we'll pause there. Um, the genesis of this paper was when I was working with one of our resident physicians, an atheist, who shared with me the moral injury he was experiencing working in a Catholic healthcare system. He was frustrated that hospital administrators consistently placed the bottom line ahead of the needs of patients, nurses, staff, and physicians. He asked me, as a Catholic, why experiencing or providing good quality of care delivered in that facility would make th anyone think well of the church's values. I think it's time that we appreciate that the healthcare systems we've created undermine our evangelization and start to think critically about what we need to do differently. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Redinger. Um, I just realized that I forgot to introduce myself at the beginning of this talk. 
but so I will ask the questioners to introduce themselves and uh, their affiliation as they ask the question. Hi there, my name is Ethan Schimler. I'm a family medicine resident here in town um, in South Bend. Thank you all for your talks. I feel like in some ways it was you guys were all recapitulating um, disputes that were so prominent at the beginning of the birth of bioethics in, um, in America, especially you, Loris. Um, I'd like to pose, uh, put you into conversation with each other a little bit and pose a little bit of a question out of Stanley Howard Voss's book. You know, he famously said of Paul Ramsey that it was a nice book, patient as a person was, but all the theology was in the introduction. Um, but I, I wonder, and I, I would like to hear your thoughts on this, I wonder how the focus on uh, the human person um, and, 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 you know, formulations that, you know, put it in biological terms specifically, and I wonder how that lends itself towards just another form of humanism as opposed to taking a, a page out of another Russian thinker's book, Solovyov, who uh, loves to use the term of God-manhood, the God-manhood of Christ revealed to uh, give us his own God-manhood. So I wonder if you would just you know, reflect on that you know, humanism and um, Christian versions of, of personhood. So I guess I don't just quickly see why a Christian notion of persons would drive one towards a, towards a humanistic approach in a, in a secular sense. I think the opposite is very much the case. And I think if one takes the doctrine of the Imago Dei seriously, and if one takes that in a way, and, and here's where I'll just let you know that of late I've been reading a book called Calvin's Doctrine of Man. So it is a profoundly, shall we say, Calvinistic understanding of the complete, utter dependence of the human being on God in the bearing of the image of God as a reflection, like Calvin says, as in a mirror. And so if you take that kind of a biblical understanding to heart about this utter dependence, that if God were to blink, as it were, I'm gone. There's nothing in me inherently independent of God to sustain myself. I have not within myself what I need for capacity of any kind. I am fundamentally incapacitated. So to the, the important question that's being raised, I think, yes, it's true that these questions have been percolating for a long time, but I actually think that in a sense what we saw back in the 70s and whatnot is the beginning of paths that are parting. And with time, I think you only see greater and greater distance between those paths. And it's just a matter, I, I think, of time and circumstance before push comes to shove in any way, when it actually then boils down to some very real clinical implications about how we treat each other as embodied selves, soul and body together, and who gets to count as a person within the, the so-called boundary problem. Did, did you want to speak to that? That's a that just briefly, uh, one thing we didn't discuss much today is the category, the framework of the sanctity of life. So it's very popular to talk about human dignity, uh, that one of the benefits of human sanctity as articulated by the Christian tradition is the understanding of the word sanctity, not just as holiness, I think of holiness, maybe you do too, but a secondary definition would be inviolability. And something that's really valuable that's brought by the Christian understanding, Christian humanism of the human being, is the inviolability. Uh, and it has to do with, um, as you say, the, the image of God, um, image as uh, something that is immutable. If we're in the image of society, which I think secular humanism would say, uh, that's a very mutable characteristic. So uh, we can't neglect the sanctity of life. Yeah, I think if... Um I don't have much to add to that other than if you take the analogy that Loris used of the fork in the road um, and you think about um, your Catholic corporate conglomerate and think about which side of the fork you think they might be on when you walk through, I, mean, I think how you answer that question depends on um, how you feel about Catholic health care. So. Dr. Redinger, I'm so impressed. Uh, my name is Dr. Kathleen Birchelman. I'm a pediatrician and I'm the co-founder of My Catholic Doctor and I've spent the last 20 years struggling with everything you outlined and I have never heard anyone outline it so well. Thank you for your passion. My question is, 
what's the solution? And um, so I'm the co-founder of My Catholic Doctor. We, we opened in 2018 after at the Catholic Medical Association, all the independent Catholic clinics of which there's about 20 in the United States, sheepishly and quietly finally admitted not one of them were financially self-sustaining without philanthropic support, even when you accounted for charity care. Um, that nobody can sustain their independent Catholic clinics based on their own billing, even with no charity care. And, uh, and so we started My Catholic Doctor with the goal of using the decreased overhead of telehealth to make Catholic health care more accessible. And I'm here to say it's been harder than we ever imagined. And I'm still not financially self-sustaining. And um, fundraising is profoundly difficult because everyone thinks we should be making tons of money because we're doctors and we're health care. And... Um, and at the same time, um, referring to uh, um, Dr. Brown and doc, uh, Dr. I'm, I'm sorry, Dr. Loris's um, um, beautiful presentations, we do the dirty work that these Catholic health systems aren't doing. We're doing abortion pill reversal, care for detransitioners, um, infertility care, natural family planning in 50 states. We sued the Biden administration for removing natural family planning from the Affordable Care Act. Our little tiny 160 doctor organization did it, not the Catholic health systems. We created a, a method for um, treat, testing and treating for male infertility consistent with Catholic teaching. None of them did it. and. Um, but I can't do it financially self-sustaining yet. So my question is, do you think there is a model for financially self-sustaining, faithful Catholic health care in the United States, answering the call of Jesus Christ in Luke chapter 10, verse 9, when he said, cure the sick who are there, and say to them, the kingdom of God has come near to you, recognizing the whole human person as described by this panel? Yeah. So uh, first off, thank you. I, I, you know, I may have been stood up and said something, but um, I'm 20 years late to the game. Um, that's As I start to talk about this and I hear from Catholic docs, I hear from many of them who um, who have the exact same perspective on American Catholic health care as it is now. Um, but it seems to me that that opinion or that insight is not at all shared by um, the decision makers at, uh, I, I guess, within the church structure. There's sort of this, I, I think too often I hear stories about sort of independent Catholic doctors as being sort of fringe, um, fringe figures and, and, and a belief that really um, these Catholic healthcare systems are, are, are genuinely Catholic. Um, I, I think the first step has to be a recognition that um, what we're doing now is, is fundamentally broken. Um, and to recognize that there are people who have already recognized that and started to form alternatives. Um, and then I think once you have sort of at least institutional church recognition and, and perhaps even backing, then then there's an, there's opportunities to rethink what we're doing. But I, I wish I had a better answer for, the, for you than that. Um, and I just want to say thank you for the work that you're doing. Yeah. So... Um, I'm uh, Christopher Deacock. I'm a child neurologist and epileptologist. Well, child neurologist makes me sound like Doogie Howdyberg. I'm a <laughs> pediatric neurologist and epileptologist. And um, Dr. Callahan, you know exactly what my question is going to be. When you say so-called brain-dead individuals, are you saying those individuals who are diagnosed according to the current American Academy of Neurology guidelines that only che check for partial brain death? Or are you talking about those individuals who are truly whole brain dead and disintegrate and die? So I would encourage everyone to listen to the recording that was made yesterday at Chris's joint presentation with others that engages in great detail that we don't have time to go into right now on that question. My straightforward, and, and Chris and I also had a wonderful 45 or 60 minute conversation after right. that session. Just clarify. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, no. So, no, no. so it's, it's really important. And, and where I'm going with it, in fact, I hear that there's a very nice connection, at least in my, shall we say, 30,000 foot view sense for the connection between Spayman, who says basically we cannot separate person from life, to the question of so-called, as I say, so-called brain death criteria and biological life, because even now, those of you who know this literature, someone as well known as Robert Trug from Boston, a, a, a pediatric critical care doctor there, who's, I tend to associate his name with most of the, the 
top tier sort of articles in the New England Journal of Medicine and JAMA on this question. He acknowledges straightforwardly in his publications that brain death does not equal biological death. So on his own terms, that's what I mean by so-called brain death because in the public's ear, I actually think that the public has been encouraged, sort of socialized to think, oh, if it's brain death, it's also a form of death death. I'm saying so-called to say that it's actually not, in my judgment, death. It's not biological death. So that's, that's what I mean to say. But I really encourage you all to listen to Chris's presentation. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Sorry. We'll take uh, one more question, and then that'll put us over. Um, sorry for the other uh, questioners, but we got to make the kickoff. So. <laughs> so thank you all, first of all, for, for, for wonderful, wonderful presentations. Uh, John Sugar, I'm an advanced uh, heart failure specialist background, master's in philosophy from Catholic University, past president of the Catholic Medical Association. Um, I'd love to go into the debate about the ontology of death, <laughs> but that's not my, my question. because, But um, uh, so... I worked at Mayo Clinic for 15 years, and now I'm the head of hope with heart failure at Trinity Health in Steubenville, Ohio, which is a subsidiary of, or is part of Common Spirit, right? So I've seen the sisters leave at Mayo Clinic, and I've seen uh, there's very good people within that uh, Common Spirit system trying to do good things, but I, I've, I've seen what you've described as well. Um, Here's my question. I perhaps naively, when I um, uh, ran the CMA's conference, I believe in 2017, the subtitle to the conference was Developing a Parallel System of Health Care, right? Um, you know, Kathleen and I have known each other for a long time, and she and so many others are doing heroic work. I had sort of naively thought that you might have large Catholic billionaire business interests and third party, and there were some third party providers there, and support of bishops and politicians and so forth to begin trying to develop the solution, Michael, that you're, you're looking at. So my simple question is, and it's a follow up on Kathleen's, it's a simple but simple question with not a simple answer. What is the platform on which that solution can be developed? Is it some? I mean, is it something that the USCCB has to say needs to be the case and get religious orders in, involved? Before we figure out how to solve the problem, what platform are we going to use to solve it? There's heroic individuals doing great things, and certainly it starts there. But we need to organize. So, yeah, thank I you. I think that's great. I think I think the CMA actually can play a, a, a role here, a, a critical role here. Um, I, I and I know I, I know a great many number of individuals who work in mission integration who are doing. I agree with you, incredible work trying to nudge their organizations, but they're just not empowered. I mean, they, they just don't exist within a structure that that takes what they have to say critically um, uh, or seriously. Um, it certainly doesn't impact the day-to-day -day operations, um, at least not in my experience and what I hear, what I hear oftentimes. Um, I, I, I think that, I, I think a lot of what I've, I've said and what I think I've heard from docs, such as yourselves, um, would be a shocker in many ways to many bishops. Um, I think they, once a year, they go into the Catholic hospital, they get treated to a nice lunch with uh, the mission integration officers and the CEO. They find out that, nope, still no abortions are being performed. And they think, okay, well then clearly we're doing a good job. Um, and as long as I'm not hearing anything from my parishioners or um, folks in my community, you know, I don't have any reason not to think that that's the case. I, I think what I'm, I, so I, I guess um, may, maybe I'm too harsh to give up on uh, on, on Catholic health care as it's currently structured, but um, the, I think the resources are there, but, but I, I don't know how we exactly pull those back out of the structures that have already been developed uh, to support the kind of work that, that you are doing, unless the bishops uh, exercise their, um, their appropriate juridical authority or uh, work with, through sort of the bishops conferences to create that sort of juridical authority that, that le legitimately has, uh, is empowered in a way that um, 
the public juridic persons that have been created um, don't don't function as so. But also to use their influence to bring in the resources. Yeah. But exactly. My, that's my question. You understand public juridic persons better than anybody I've ever met. I love it. So can the bishops with this public juridic person um, uh, uh, structure in their 990s? Do the bishops have any pow real power here? My understanding is no, especially with common spirit. It has to come out of the Vatican. What's your opinion on that? Yeah, I, so there's been a lot of interesting conversation actually at the Senate about uh, the role of the national conferences and their juridical role. And so I'm, I'm, I'm ignorant here, I, I admit, but I'm curious about whether or not where the USCCB could play a role in this, in this from a juridic standpoint. Um, I, I say that not as a theologian. If you're a canonist, feel free to correct me. Um, but uh, yeah, I think, um, where was I going with that? Um, I, yeah, I, I think we have to, I, I think most people have no idea what a public juridic person is, what role it plays in Catholic health care. Interestingly for Ascension, um, it's a legal entity that's just called Ascension Sponsor, like that's legitimately the name of it, it's just Ascension Sponsor. Um, it, it, and, and you can't find anywhere who the members are, um, what they do. Um, and so I, I think they operate in sort of this this legal area that that's... Um, uh, from a canon, from a, a church law perspective, that um, checks the boxes, but I, I think otherwise the bishops have have uh, just abdicated their role in oversight, but but largely through ignorance and lack of expertise. So, great. Well, thank you for your participation. Thanks to our speakers.